So this guy walks up to you and says, I've got this great new way for producing green power. It's just got a few bugs in the system. The fuel is a thousand times more expensive than gold, is much more toxic than cyanide, and is screamingly radioactive before you even start. Oh yeah, and it can only sensibly be made in a nuclear reactor. Welcome to the world of fusion, merging atoms to make power. Well, let's start with the basics. What are hydrogen, deuterium, and tritium? Well, they're all basically hydrogen, which is a, a nucleus containing a single proton. You add one extra neutron to it, you get deuterium. Two extra neutrons and tritium. But that extra neutron makes tritium kind of unstable, by which I mean radioactive, which is immediately interesting. Why would someone choose the almost non-existent, screamingly radioactive version of hydrogen to use as a fuel? Now, hydrogen, well, at least the non-radioactive versions of hydrogen, are the most common nuclei in your body, making up some 60 odd percent of the atoms in your body. Yes, over half the atoms in your body are hydrogen. Uh, not terribly surprising if you think about it. Most of your body is water, and two thirds of the atoms in water are hydrogen atoms. Now, hydrogen and deuterium are naturally occurring stable nuclei, all present in your body. Tritium doesn't really naturally occur in any way, shape, or form for one important reason. It is screamingly radioactive. How radioactive? Interesting story. Some time ago, we did a load of experiments about whether heavy water had a taste to it. And it turns out, yes, it tastes kind of sweet, which was interesting for all sorts of reasons. I mean, firstly, because you would expect it to have no taste at all. And secondly, if it does have a taste, why sweet? Why not salty or bitter or sour or something. But it turns out you're actually tasting the quantum nuclear effects. Or more specifically, you're tasting the absence of quantum nuclear effects. And when I've given talks on such topics, one of the most common questions is, is if heavy water, D2O, tastes sweet, does T2O, super heavy water, taste even sweeter? Well, probably. But no one is ever going to find out for a couple of reasons. Remember what I said it was screamingly radioactive? I mean, let me put this into perspective. Low levels of radiation, yeah, like what you would get on a plane, which is like 30 times background, your body happily compensates around. I mean, you get a cell death in your body all the time and radiation basically enhances that. However, if you get a lot of radiation, you get a lot of cell death, kind of like you would in, say, a, a burn which is why when you get lots of cell death due to radiation, they're called radiation burns. The amount of damage done is proportional to the amount of energy of the particles given off when that radioactive stuff decayed within your body. But to a first degree approximation, all nuclear decays give off about the same amount of energy, mega electron volts per decay. Now some might say, hang on, you just put two numbers up there that are way different. One is 0.02 mega electron volts, and the other one was 5 mega electron volts. There's over a hundred times difference between those two numbers. Well, yes, but sometimes that really doesn't make a big difference. It's like debating which is more dangerous, getting shot by bullets or railgun bullets. None of it's really going to change the ultimate conclusion that they're both kind of dangerous. So how toxic is tritium compared to, say, polonium-210? which was most famously used in the murder of journalist Alexander Litvinenko. Well, apparently about 10 micrograms, that's like a speck of dust of polonium, was fatal. So we've already mentioned electron volts, which is just a measure of energy. When a single radioactive particle decays, it'll release mega electron volts of energy. And when those fast particles zip through your body, they interact with stuff and dump that energy, mostly by essentially breaking chemical bonds. The energy to break a chemical bond is electron volt type energy. So give or take a single nuclear radioactive decay will dump about enough energy to break a million or so chemical bonds. And if you get enough of that, you get burns. Get too much of it and you get acute radiation poisoning. And too much of that, and you die. So how does tritium compare to polonium in terms of its ability to break bonds per gram of material? 
So let's start with the basics. A nucleus of polonium-210 weighs um, 210 atomic mass units, whilst tritium weighs 3. So the 10 micrograms, which was fatal, would contain about 70 times more tritium nuclei as the same mass of polonium. But I'm lazy, so I'm just going to call out 50. Ah, but the half-life of polonium-210 is about a third of a year, while the half-life of tritium is about 10 years, which means that the polonium, or the nuclei in it, are giving off radiation about 30 times faster than the tritium. But I'm lazy, so I'm just going to call it 50 times. So equal masses of tritium and polonium will be giving off about the same number of radioactive particles per second. Ah, but the radioactive particles coming off the tritium are about 100 times weaker than those coming off the polonium. So the fatal dose of polonium was about a speck of dust, about 10 micrograms. You would expect that the tritium fatal dose will be 100 times greater. You know, a, a, a hundred specks of dust. Yeah, sometimes a factor of 100 really doesn't make that much difference. Now, I'm a little skeptical about those numbers, so I recalculated the amusing tritium literature numbers, and it comes out much less toxic than that, although it's still about 10 times as toxic as cyanide. But there would be other problems about getting pure T2O just to taste test it in the first place. In regular water, the oxygen weighs some 16 and the hydrogen's one apiece, so that's two. So about 10% of the mass of the water is hydrogen. The deuterium weighs twice as much, so it's about 20% of the water is deuterium. Super heavy water, about 30% of the mass is going to be tritium. So one kilogram of super heavy water contains about 300 grams of tritium. Tritium is some $30,000 per gram. Gold, for reference, is about $50 per gram, so it's about a thousand times more expensive than gold. So a kilogram of T2O would cost about $10 million. And one gram of tritium does some 300 trillion disintegrations per second, each releasing some 20-odd kilo electron volts. So we can calculate how many kilo electron volts this is going to release per second, which is a heck of a lot. Then you need to multiply that by the 300 odd grams of tritium that we have, meaning that we are dumping uh, this many electron volts into our one kilogram of water per second. Yeah, that doesn't mean a lot to me either. But thankfully, we can convert this into something more uh, uh, accessible. So one joule is about six to the power of 18 electron volts. A watt is, of course, just a joule per second. So it's just six divided by 2,000, which is about mm, 1,000 divided by three. It's about 300 joules per second, 300 watts. That's how much power our one kilo of super heavy water will be generating. For reference, humans run at about 100 watts and weigh about 100 kilos. So that's roughly one watt per kilo. And that'll keep your body temperature at a fairly stable 30 degrees Celsius. A kettle runs at about 2,000 watts and will boil one kilo of water in about 10 minutes. So with the super heavy water, it might not spontaneously boil, but it's not far off it either. So why would you use such an insanely dangerous fuel to run a fusion reactor? It's super expensive and it's incredibly dangerous. Why not just run your fusion reactor on regular hydrogen. Well, like most of these things, if you can understand what happens in a drop of water, yes, the exact same mundane water that covers most of the planet, eh, falls from the sky occasionally and makes up most of your body, you can understand this. And other things like why life is so chaotic and necessarily doesn't make sense a lot of the time. But maybe that's a video for another time. For the moment, we'll just content ourselves with why tritium is the favoured fuel for fusion. It really is this simple. If you understand this, you understand most of the physical universe. So if you could zoom into a drop of water, this is what you would see. What you're looking at is about a billionth of a metre in size and about a billionth of a second in time scale. Now, the temperature is basically how fast the particles are moving. So if you would plot up the energy of the particles versus how many of them have that energy, you would get something like this. Now, if you were to do the same thing with the water a little hotter, 
you would see that the particles move more quickly. Now, you might have noticed that the hotter water droplet has more water molecules in the gas phase around it. This is because the water is strongly held together by these hydrogen bonds. But every now and again, a water molecule has enough energy to break that last hydrogen bond and the water leaves the surface of the droplet. It evaporates. But there's no real barrier to this process. So if this is the amount of energy you need to leave, some amount of the waters will have that amount of energy and can evaporate. And as it gets hotter, a greater fraction of the water molecules have that much energy. But critically, there is no barrier. So this is the energy of the water molecule stuck to the surface of the droplet. And then if it's got enough energy, it can go up the hill and evaporate. But critically, there is no barrier here. What if there were a barrier that was sufficiently high that none of the molecules had enough energy to get over that barrier? And what might that look like in practice? Well, in order to make water, you can burn hydrogen and oxygen. But hydrogen and oxygen, if you mix them together, don't really do anything. There is a barrier that stops them from reacting. Until, of course, you give them enough energy to get over the barrier that allows them to burn. And those burning molecules release enough energy for even more molecules to react. And this is exactly the problem with fusion. If you can get your hydrogen nuclei to merge, to fuse, they will release loads of energy. But there's a barrier that you've got to get over to do that. So this is now the universe in perspective. The rough amount of energy to break a hydrogen bond that's holding most of your body together is about a tenth of an electron volt. And a small fraction of molecules at room temperature have that amount of energy. But the molecules don't have enough energy to get over the activation barrier to burn hydrogen and oxygen at room temperature. You need to get up to about 500 degrees Celsius to do that. But if you do get over that, it'll burn per reaction, releasing electron volts type of energy. And the flame temperature of releasing that energy is about 3000 degrees Celsius, about half the temperature of the surface of the sun. Now, it's somewhat hotter than the temperature of the surface of the sun, about 10,000 degrees Celsius, yet yeah, getting hot enough that some of the electrons have enough energy to evaporate off the hydrogen atoms and create the plasma. So this is about 10,000 degrees and 10 electron volts worth of energy. So a tenth of an electron volt was hydrogen bonds, electron volts was chemical bonds, tens of electron volts is plasma, and remember what I was saying, this is actually to scale. The barrier you need to get over for fusion is tens of thousands of electron volts. But if you can get over that barrier, you release millions of electron volts. Although this is really only the start of your problem. Remember, releasing just a few electron volts per reaction looked like this and raised your temperature to about half the temperature of the surface of the sun. Releasing millions of electron volts per reaction. Yeah, the particles end up going a significant fraction of the speed of light. So using that released energy to try and initiate fusion has only ever really been successfully done in one arena. And at that, only for microseconds. Most of what you're looking at here is just the, the plasma. Yeah, you remember the plasma at like 10,000 degrees. Fusion only went on for the first microsecond of this explosion and has long since stopped. So fusing deuterium and tritium releases about 10 mega electron volts. Splitting a uranium atom releases about 200 mega electron volts. But of course, to split a uranium atom, you can do without that huge kilo electron volt barrier. That barrier is um, tens of thousands of electron volts, which is comparable to the energy of the beta particle that tritium gives off. Whereas the alpha particle was about five mega electron volts, which if we zoom back in to how much energy our chemical bond has, you can still see that there's enough energy in these particles to break an awful lot of chemical bonds in organic life. So why tritium? Well, it turns out the barrier to fuse a deuterium and a tritium nucleus 
is about 10 times smaller than the barrier for fusing a couple of deuteriums, which basically reduces the temperature that you need to make it happen from merely hundreds of millions of degrees to tens of millions of degrees. So not far off the relative difference between the energy of evaporating water and evaporating the electrons of the nuclei, you know, to make a plasma. It's just a million times bigger in energy. And because of that, it's worth dealing with a fuel that is a thousand times more expensive than gold, incredibly toxic and incredibly difficult to manufacture. Pretty much underlining why fusion hasn't gone anywhere outside of bombs for the last 50 years. Now, doubtless at this point, there will be someone writing in the comments that, yes, all of this video was a complete waste, and you could have just told us that in 30 seconds at the beginning. Well, yes. But these videos really aren't about sort of superficial knowledge. They're about understanding the thermodynamics, the heartbeat of the universe, why things happen and why things don't happen. The world is full of people telling you seductive lies about how fusion is closer than you think. No, really, tritium, it's less radioactive than fission fuels like uranium and can simply be sourced from seawater. To be more specific, you can use deuterium and tritium, which are hydrogen isotopes. Besides being more stable than fission fuel, these elements are more widely available as they're mostly sourced from seawater. Except no. Tritium is about a billion times more radioactive than uranium. I mean, remember our little zoom from earlier, going merely from electron volts to mega electron volts. That's a factor of about a million. You would need to have to zoom out another factor of a thousand to be as wrong as Matt Ferrell is here. Oh, and what was the second thing? That tritium can simply be pulled out of seawater? Besides being more stable than fission fuel, these elements are more widely available as they're mostly sourced from seawater. Except no, that's complete bullshit. There is no tritium in seawater. Or more specifically, the concentration of tritium in seawater is about a million times lower than the concentration of gold in seawater. Tritium is basically only made in nuclear power plants. So you can probably see why fusion is considered much safer and greener than fission. On top of that, it can yield four times more energy than a conventional reaction. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure what a conventional reaction is. But like I was saying, merging deuterium and tritium gets you some 10, 20 mega electron volts, that sort of thing. Whilst the conventional reaction of splitting uranium yields about 200 mega electron volts. On top of that, it can yield four times more energy than a conventional reaction. Yeah, I know the high production value clickbait with its huge fusion update will win in the click wars. I mean, how could it not? Because, you know, it takes less time to make bullshit claims than accurate, well-researched ones. Yeah, I know it's a losing battle, but this channel always was a scream of defiance against weaponized stupidity and the influences of ignorance. Anyway, that's today's video. I hope you found it interesting. And as ever, if you want to directly support this channel, you can do it through Patreon. Thanks for watching.